Welcome back. At this point, we've learned that there are some shaky foundations and even basic concepts like what is a function? Should it be the graph of the inputs and outputs? Should it be the set of rules that it follows? Does every function really have a domain? All of these concepts have been covered in the previous videos, which I recommend you see. Right now we're dealing with the concept of substitution-based functions. This is the idea brought out by Alonzo Church in 1930. His idea was to fix some of the problems at the foundations of function theory, as in based on sets, and make sure that they're robust enough to write it in the language of logic, upon which you might build things like type theory and set theory. It doesn't solve every problem, but it gets at some key ideas that you'll be seeing throughout your careers. The first thing is, what does it actually mean to describe a variable? We've seen before that variables have two sorts of notions. Their one major notion is that we simply have symbols we want to replace, like the letter X, but it could be the letter L or P or many other things. Once we have that notion of a function, then replacing it needs some rules. And the reason is we can wind up into paradoxes if we don't follow the rules that we need. For example, when we have consistent substitution, we should be able to deal with one variable at a time. This will allow us to make sure we have the simplest model possible. We need to be able to rename variables without getting into trouble. In fact, it'll be one way to get out of trouble. That way, we can think about functions such as the identity, not depending on the variable. That's the connection between lambda calculus and combinators that we see in a later lecture. But we also need a way to reduce the outcomes. We'll call this beta reduction. We want to take the results of the process and remove the process and just get at the outcome. x plus 2 minus 2 is the same as x, but they're not the same expression. That's the, vari that's the variations based on reductions. And a convenience for many of us is to be able to name our functions so we don't have to deal with the worst possible conventions with long, long lists. We can simply say, if you look up this name, you'll see what these pieces mean. With all that in mind, we're able to use this notion of function in a very diverse way. You can program with it. You can do logic. You can even do mathematics. But this is perhaps also making it the most difficult type of function. Because it has to serve so many masters, it's difficult to get away with shortcuts and be imprecise in what we mean. So let's take a look at what we're trying to do. If we have two variables or more, we would certainly want to think of these as functions where we write the substitution. Here we use something which today is known as currying. It was actually discovered before, but curry's name has been lasting. What we do here is if we have a multiple input function, such as x plus y, which depends on x and y, and to some degree even also on plus, we can simply take the values and partially evaluate them one at a time. For example, we can make an intermediate function called L sub x, which takes as input y and outputs x plus y. The variable x is delayed to a future function called x maps to lx. This type of abstraction lets us deal with one variable at a time and get that precise notion before worrying about multiple variables. Now what is it exactly when I write x arrow something? Today it's called a lambda in honor of Church's lambda calculus. We also just call them anonymous functions, especially when we program. In a model like this, we'll think of m as the thing we want to substitute into. It has to have some variables, and variables we saw before are defined completely by the language. They're alphabet letters that are designated to be the role of variables. We're simply binding them to the arrow by putting it on one side of the arrow, or in the lambda notation, putting a lambda next to that variable. What we have done is, in a sense, made that variable local in scope to the values of m. If there is an x occurring outside of this region, it's assumed to be a different x, and we'll see that matters for consistent substitution. By binding x to m, we are saying we now focus on how x's are used in m in one unique way. It also, on a practical level, lets us reuse variables. Now, in most models of logic, you're allowed as many variables as you can count, so it's not a problem of running out of variables, but we do, in the end, want to type up the letter x more often than x1, x2, x3, and so forth. Keep these names interchangeably in your mind. Anonymous and Lambda are both the same idea. Now let's take our first draft at the concept of rules for Lambda calculus. That is, simple rules of substitution. Perhaps the simplest example is we should not defeat the concept of an identity function. 
If x maps to x, we should be able to evaluate it at anything, for example at 7, and come out with the number 7. If we write that in formulas, we would see the following type of line. We would say x is assigned c, and x maps to x yields c. Now keep in mind the notation x is defined equal to c is using a different version of equals than the equal sign is in judgment. This is an assignment, and technically variables are not assigned. In fact, in many courses in logic, you'll see this denoted as a fraction, c over x. The idea here is that variables are meant to be replaced, not assigned values. Even so, the practice of programming has preferred that type of notation for so long, it's hard to overcome the value it adds by using this misnotation. But keep in mind, not everyone will agree. So identities do, in fact, seem to behave appropriately. Just replace the variables identically. Constant functions are another natural example. If we have a constant that always outputs 3, then it doesn't matter what input we give. We should give the same number back. And again, in symbols, this doesn't need a name like k. It simply needs to know that x is assigned a constant a, and that when we assign a c to x, it doesn't affect the a. And finally, we would think the next natural rule is to glue this together with repeated steps, induction or recursion, depending on how you want to view the problem, as a theorem or as an algorithm. Here, we would have a list of different operations, here denoted just in two, but we could apply it to ABCs as well. If we want to substitute a value x assigned to c in AB, we simply do this individually and take the results together. This is the natural idea. What can go wrong? Well, we can hit this classic problem of variable capture, which we saw in our previous video. You can have a situation where something begins like a constant, but after fiddling with the wrong substitutions, you end up with the identity, which is truly a violation of the concept of constant. The problem here is that we cannot simply substitute without some orders of operations, some set of rules. And keep in mind, the addition of rules means that we might limit the functions we create. It thus opens up the need to prove results about our functions. Do they really interpret everything we want to do? The answer will be yes, but it will take work. The key solution here is to rename a variable before it gets trapped. So now let's make a second draft. Which of the functions was really at the heart of the variable capture problem? We saw the identity function doesn't change any of the parameters, so it's hard to catch anything if nothing's changing. But constants do change. They're selecting whether you want the constant value or the input. So there is where we have to focus our attention. The recursion rule should then take over and repeat this on any large system. So the place we need to focus our attention is refining the rules of constant substitution. There are some that remain unchanged. We start out in an inductive fashion. If we were trying to substitute into an atomic term, something that's a variable or something that's a constant for our language, we should have no trouble simply replacing it with a, under the condition that x is not involved in a. It's that circular x that caused our problem in the original interpretation. So, once we have that version of constant applied, what if we're trying to substitute into another function? This then leads to a situation where there might be several variables involved. So we treat them in separate cases. If we're trying to substitute a function of functions, such as one that we may be curried, then we might need to look at the variable x and does it occur within b. If we're reusing it, it's essentially a local variable. That variable is now frozen to the context of b and will never be reused again in the same way. So the fact that we used x outside is a coincidence of convenience, but it is not meant to be the same variable. In that case, the middle remains as a constant. We would simply substitute x implies b, or sorry, x maps to b, just like we see. In the third situation, we have another function in the middle, but now with a different variable. If the variable in this middle function is y, right here, we're forced to think about whether this could accidentally occur as part of this x that we're trying to substitute. So here, the variable x needs to still be a variable, but not one that's in b. That's a b, I apologize. And there, our substitution gets more complicated. We still want to keep this as constant, but we have to inspect that this here does not have an x in the b. These are all the ones that remain constant in the usual sense. What follows next is more complicated. 
but not beyond our understanding. Suppose we're still trying to substitute into a function of functions, the nature of all these complicated variable trapping rules. If x is not a free variable of b, it doesn't occur there, and y is not also in c, then these variables do not seem to talk to each other, and so the substitution should go through in a routine way. However, examining where the variable x is, is means that we need to substitute it in the b. We're not going to change the y. And likewise, if we look at the last case, where x is a variable in b and y is a variable in c, this is where we need to rename, because what we mean is to first replace x with an auxiliary variable not already being used, and then we can substitute correctly. If you keep these rules in mind, everything will work out the way you expect, though it might take you a while to get comfortable with this, but the substitutions you've been doing in your mind are probably the way that you're seeing here. Some order of operations was done implicitly in front of most of us when we substituted, but this captures precisely to the degree that you would need if you were, for example, making a computer program based on these. They're called today the Curry Phase Rules. If you want to read more, here are two citations. Again, the Compendium by Hindley and Milner is an excellent source, but you can also find online sources. Just search for Curry Phase.